All right, uh, let us begin. So uh, hello and welcome to this webinar on industrial and commercial heat pump installation highlights. Uh, we have a one hour webinar ready for you with a rapid fire series of heat pump projects, all the latest of what's happening across many different sites. My name is Jared Leake and I'm the CEO of the Australian Alliance for Energy Productivity. And I'd like to commence this uh, webinar with a acknowledgement of the traditional coast custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community and pay my respects to elders past, present and into the future as well. For those of you that are new to A2EP, we are a non-for-profit industry association focused on energy productivity. And we have this beautiful broad spectrum of members uh, which supports our vision of improving energy productivity and using that to drive decarbonisation. And a big shout out and thank you to this wonderful set of members uh, without which such support we couldn't bring you these sorts of webinars. Just a little bit of housekeeping. Yes, the slides uh, will be distributed to you along with a recording early next week. And uh, we're certainly aiming, aiming to have this as an interactive session. Uh, we'll take questions at the end. Often we take one or two questions after each presenter, but we're just gonna go straight through uh, this, uh, the, all, the, all the projects today and then have a, a discussion at the end. So please type in your questions and, and I'm fairly confident we're gonna have time to get to them. So uh, this is a great opportunity for you to uh, ask the experts about what's happening in this heat pump market. Uh, so yeah, put that in that uh, Q&A. Joining me today from Team A2EP, Brendan Voss. Brendan, you're there. Welcome. I'm um, here. Yeah, all good. Just on mute. Gotcha. Snuck up on you there. Thanks for joining today, Brendan, and uh, look forward to you helping with that as questions and uh, and uh, hitting the panel with the hard hitting questions as well. And so this is our third of four webinars this month, focused on heat pumps. Uh, well, a couple of weeks ago, we did have that technology presentation from Dr. Corden Arpagas. Uh, if you missed that one, go find that one on YouTube. It's uh, got hundreds of views already, and that's a, a world-class review of high temperature heat pumps. And you'll see uh, just how much uh, that uh, market has grown and the R&D that's happening there. Uh, last week, we stepped through what's happening in terms of optimization of heat pumps and ways to integrate that and, and modeling of those. And so again, that one is available on YouTube as well. So uh, plenty there. Today, we're focused on projects, 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 just in case you weren't sure that heat pumps were taking off in Australia, uh, that heat pumps have taken over and are taking over the, the, the role of uh, uh, fossil fuels, fired boilers and whatnot. Uh, you're going to see that today. Uh, it's a little bit of a rapid fire, maybe a little bit of speed dating here that you're going to. It's going to be coming at you, uh, but for sure you're going to. You, you'll finish today thinking, "Well, uh, there is uh, heat pumps just about replacing uh, heat, uh, other boiler type applications everywhere." And so joining us today to run through that, uh, we have this fantastic panel of experts, uh, each of these been working with heat pumps for a long time and been slugging out and now they're seeing things really move and action on that. And each of these experts within a different field and, and knowing the skills uh, required to, to economically install a heat pump. Uh, the first cap off the rank today, we have Terry Playstead from Automatic Heating. Terry, if I could get you to start up your presentation and you're going to run us through, you've got slot one of five going through the heat pump installations. I'll get you to share your screen. Uh, but for, for as a quick intro for Terry from Automatic Heating, he is their sales manager and uh, absolutely passionate about, uh, passionate about sustainability. Terry, I understand you were working on condensing boilers way back when, before they were even popular. So uh, uh, you've been on this journey, and now you're seeing probably probably less and less boilers and more and more heat pumps. And uh, yeah, that's so correct, Jared. And uh, thank you very much for the introduction. It's it's great to be included in the uh, A2E initiative and, and some of the uh, insights and understandings that customers can take away. We're seeing a, a great benefit in the um, in the journey, and and those that. That are on the electrification journey and that net zero that they're targeting is within reach isn't it would you say yeah. joe absolutely plenty of action on this now uh yeah, yeah the renewables is coming into place to make sure that the electricity that the heat pump are using is going to be low emission that's happening really at pace now and so now it's it's, it's let's get focus on getting the uh, the technology installed i'll get you yeah. to share that uh, presentation there terry that hasn't come up just yet 
now it's on its way into presentation mode and you are good to go. Thank you, Jared. Um, I trust you can uh, share that, that screen is uh, sharing okay. Uh, it still looks like it's on the, uh, the display, the editing mode. Uh, maybe have another crack at that, a surprise. I saw you hit the right button there. And we'll get out and back in. All righty. Yep. And now if you just hit display settings up the top left there, and we'll change to swap the, change that to swap presenting. Yeah, and then we will be in business in your hands. Has that worked, uh, Jared? Somehow it did not swap, Terry. So it, we have another crack at that one, uh, uh, display it's settings. settings uh, Jared. So and failing this, of course, I have the slides and I can drive them if we need to, Terry. Um, Jared, if you yeah, if you got them there. Yeah, just give me a moment. Let me bring them up. All righty. Terry, they should look very familiar. Thank you, Jared. Um, yeah, it's it's a it's a unique um journey that the uh, the customers have embraced and uh, we're here to, as automatic eating to support the, the end user and, this, and those that have embraced that journey. It's um, as a leading supplier to the heating and hot water market, uh, we specialize in tailored solutions, <laughs> taking into account the, um, the heat pump technology and, and some of the huge benefits that they customers can take away, such as the, uh, the cost running reduction and the, um, the ability for them to be retrofit. So retrofit is a is a um, quite a a, a unique uh, application. We're presenting on this screen today with a, a project we delivered some time back in um, at Adelaide College at the TAFE there at the Arts Centre. It was we were tasked with the need to have a um, a solution that was retrofitted into where existing boilers were placed. And um, you look at the the needs for existing systems, the high temperature heating hot water and the and the um, space requirements, potentially the power requirements. And we were asked to work along with the consultants and engineers and contractor to provide a turnkey, um, turnkey supply of the heat pump technology. I think if you um, click to the next slide, you'll see the um, one of the one of the photographs of three high temperature heat pumps. Now these heat pumps are able to operate at uh, eighty degrees Celsius, and that that in itself is quite a, a task for a heat pump in um, in cold conditions. And these unique Revere um, AHG one thirty heat pumps have that um, the ability to provide 80 degrees Celsius, which works in with the existing infrastructure, whether it's the air handlers or whether it's the um, circulating pumps and the flow rates, this was um, coupled into the, the indoor plant room and ducted out through the roof. But the, the uniqueness was the existing power supply could be used, um, the circulating pumps and the, and the space requirement. Out of a couple of the um, insights that we found was to include in uh, future designs is to make sure the, the the power requirement is there and the ability to allow for service and maintenance long term. The second slide shows us a project of the regional uh, university in Victoria. Now you know regional Victoria, we've um, get a very cool climate. And it's important to select a heat pump that takes care of the, the low temperature ambience. And um, we're tasked with the requirement to provide heating and hot water. The heating and hot water was existing panel radiators and the hot water was an existing gas LPG boiler. And when you look at technology for heat pump that can... Uh, remove the requirement for LPG, there's some large energy savings. 
uh, because of the cost of LP gas and the and the infrastructure work there. So we designed and, and put together an outcome for the for the university, housing 100, 100 bedrooms in and kitchens and showers. The uh, next slide there was um, provided this out in an in an outdoor outdoor space. We had two of the CO2 heat pumps. So that's a natural refrigerant and it's unique because of the, the compactness and the, their ability to provide high temperature hot water. It's, um, it was of, of note that the, um, the tanks were inside the plant room where the existing boiler was and the heat pumps were located outside the room. And then it would stage up and, and control on demand one heat pump and the second heat pump on high demand. The third um, aspect of this project was to also include was the hydronic heating. And uh, you can see there the, the high temperature heat pump was providing 80 degrees Celsius to the panel radiators and uh, working with the existing circulating pumps in the building. And alongside that, we got the ancillary items as, as the necessary um, requirements for circulating pumps and expansion tanks and so forth. But um, the, the project was a great outcome. The project here where we're presenting at the Scotch College in Adelaide was a new build and it's a um, application where CO2 refrigerant was used to heat an, an aquatic centre. And um, the facts of this project was the compactness and the area that we had to work in, um, the efficiencies was of the highest highest priority and how to minimise the, the electrical upgrade requirement and utilise um, a COP of you know, 3.5 and above to provide heating into the full space. Um, it was combined effort with the consultant and, and automatic heating selecting the right, the right equipment and the right uh, circulating pumps for the project. This photo there shows you the um, three CO2 revered heat pumps um, captured there in a, in a quite a compact area. And the um, set point of those heat pumps was the excess of 80 degrees Celsius and um, providing that high temperature water into the plate heat exchanges and the space heating for the pool. And this has um, been operating there for 12 months and it's um, operating well and the, the low cost of operation has been being noted. Brilliant. Thanks, Jared, for that. Terry, one, two, three, the first three off there. Brilliant. Thank you so much for that. Uh, great examples and a few little stats there to take away. And good to see that 80 degrees is, is an option, although we uh, always try and encourage people to try and reduce that if they can, but I know it's not always possible. Very good. Thank you, Terry. And uh, we'll come back to you in a, uh, later on when we have some, some questions, no doubt. Uh, our second uh, run of projects is coming to us from Chun Go at uh, Energy Smart Water. Chun is the uh, general manager of uh, for Energy Smart Water and has been working in in, uh, in this space of heat pumps and uh, sustainability for several years. Uh, very good at executing projects and lots of uh, project management experience behind him. So, uh, Plenty of good stories to tell in getting these projects happening. Uh, Chun, I can see your slides coming up. We've just got to go into presentation mode and it's uh, it's over to you. All right. I hope everyone's seeing me all right over here. Yes, yeah, here. So before I begin today, it's F1 uh, Grand Prix starting. So I think we have an F1 race in my team as well. So uh, I would like to acknowledge and pay my respect to the past and present and the emerging traditional owner and custodian of the country where we all meet today. Uh, so since we're going to be uh, uh, going ahead with the first one, I straight away start with what we're going to share with the project that we are involved in. So basically, we covered projects like commercials and residential power, uh, the defense force uh, and military facility. We do uh, healthcare and hospital, aged care, and then uh, council community facilities, including their... Um, Performing Arts Center or Community Hall. We also covered industrial, including processing plant, warehouses, 
we also do aquatic center and sports facility, including football club and all those things. Uh, we also do winery, dairy, and agriculture, including greenhouses and uh, education facilities. So uh, like what we said, a quick one, I'm just going to share the recent project with a winery. This is in Kuyong, uh, located in Victoria. So what happened with this one is they have existing solar thermal system and also uh, electric boost and gas system. So it's a big, massive gas system, 165 kilowatt of gas, two unit boiler. So total of 300 over kilowatt. So what we do is we use back the thermal solar on the roof and then we combine with uh, their solar PV and then we run on heat pump to uh, operate for their hotel, sealer door, wineries and processing plant as well. So next one is uh, this project completed uh, completed recently as well, White Horse Performing Arts Center in Nunawari. So what happened with this one is we have a uh, Several heat pump and then thermal storage as well. So what we do with this one a bit special is that we have a waste heat recovery from their aircon unit. So we we capture the waste heat from the aircon when they're operating the facility. So this will help them to bring down the energy usage as well. And then this will keep the performance up for the heat pump. So heat pump basically heat up the water from a higher temperature. And the next one, this is a, one of the iconic buildings in Melbourne. So we have uh, we won an EEC award on 2022. And then with this one, uh, we have four, uh, we supply the whole system in four sections. So basically the whole tower, 54 story high tower, the domestic hot water with the ring main are covered by total of 11 heat pumps. And the other one, this one is in the CBD as well, 530 Colin. We have a tour there uh, last year. And this is an end of trip facility. It's very impressive facility that we, we, uh, we look at. So the demand are really, really high. They need about uh, 4,000 liter hot water for the first hour delivery. So, and then they have a very limited um, space for the building. So we put the heat pump in the parking lot. So this would help them to Beside, we can capture heat from the parking lot. Meanwhile, also we can uh, provide circu air circulation in the parking lot. So if you can see, we fit our thermal storage and heat pump in a very tight spot, just under the car park. Uh, beside hot water, we also do space heating, hydronic space heating or radiator space heating or fan coil space heating. So we had done this uh, several projects, including uh, some big houses in Sydney and also uh, Paramount Square, we can use heat pump combined with gas or whichever renewable energy you have. And besides air source heat pump, we also do geothermal heat pump as well, or ground source heat pump, you can say. It. So this one, uh, we had done project where we containerize the whole system with ground source heat pump and thermal storage. And then we have some gas unit on that. That is, the, this project is about eight years ago. So we containerize the whole system and we send it to the site on a poultry and then they can locate the, uh, they can plug and play straight away for their fan coil heating. Uh, the next one, this is prison. We do a lot of prison in Victoria, New South Wales. So uh, the, the photo shown here is the Youth Justice Center that recently completed. So we have 23 heat pump in place in this place. So the challenge for this project is your heat pump and thermal storage have to be in the secure places because it's a prison and accessing for servicing and all these things are very challenging and we face that we, we face the challenge that we have to uh, register our equipment every single board and month and whatever we bring in have to bring out so it's a very interesting project and dairy farm so we have our system in the dairy farm as well. As you know, the dairy farm, some have very limited uh, power. So this one, a little bit special, we use a single phase heat pump combined with their existing solar PV. So we can harvest the uh, energy from the PV during peak generation and then just do a preheating for their usage. And here's some iconic one as well, 720 Burke Street C bus building. Uh, we done many years ago. As you can see, heat pump thermal storage to supply the whole building. And uh, Yara Range Council, uh, 
we supply the domestic cold water for their uh, restaurant, kitchens, and uh, amenities. And this is uh, a recent completed project as well in Queensland, Queensland Health. Gas uh, from converting gas retrofit to heat pump. And yeah, there are some international projects with our partners overseas as well, where we had done. You can see here in Philippines, we have Sheraton's hotels and all the big hotels over there. And then in Malaysia, we have laundry factories, and then we have uh, pharmaceuticals and hotels where we have different type of thermal storage, that, uh, which is a bigger one. And in Singapore, we have Marriott, we have Shangri-La, we have Woodland Health Campus. Mm. And yeah, and you can see this is just a sample photo on what our product is overseas been, been installed over there. Sure. I think we're just about out of time, but goodness yep. me, we get the picture. <laughs> <laughs> so this is our facility in Romana. So we, I welcome everyone to come over. And uh, yeah, this is my contact. So we work along closely with consultants, engineers, uh, trades, or even in uh, the customer in-house engineers. You can speak to us. We can help you out. And then tailor the project as, uh, according to what you need. All Fantastic. right. I think that's the F F1 race for us today. You got through there, lightning speed, well done. But uh, yeah, winery, poultry, dairy, prison, uh, every, we're pretty much going to say everywhere pretty soon. But thanks for that, too, and I'll get you to stop sharing as uh, as we go move to our next uh, uh, rapid fire projects. And uh, next next cab off the rank, we've got Nigel Hunt from HSA Group uh, and uh, also known as Hunt Heating and, and uh, one of the largest uh, hydronic heating suppliers in Australia. Uh, lots of experience here and uh, just pretty recently brought on the new range, I think it was Clade uh, heat pumps out of the UK, if I'm not mistaken. And so, uh, Nigel, Welcome. Uh, love to be taken through all the different projects and things that uh, that uh, you're looking at uh, with the Hydro Heat. Thanks, Jared and Amanda, and the opportunity, obviously, to present today for uh, 2AEP um, for what is an exciting time. Um, who I am, my name's Nigel. I'm our National Specification Manager. Um, HSA Group's a new formed company. We've recently made an acquisition of um, another one of our rivals, which is Hydro Heat, which pushes us further and further into the commercial space, Hunt Heating, which was our original company, that's been for over 40 years now, and very much like Terry himself, we've been in the hydronic heating industry for a long time, predominantly going back for what would have been historically gas. So we're now involved in this big uh, envelope of excitement, which is pushing forward towards electrification, both from a domestic perspective, as well as a commercial perspective, and all the challenges and um, uh, solutions that we have to find going forward on these. So I've got a few of our projects, current projects that we've completed and that we're currently running through to show for you today. Oh, it's not working. Yeah, we're... Uh, we stopped. Stuck on the lovely title screen there. And as always... Oh, there we go. Okay, so the first one that I'll cover today, this is one of our... Uh, newest projects that's underway. So this is with the Coles Supermarket Group, um, one of their refits of their supermarkets in Dandenong. Um, it's a trial uh, site. So they're looking at always different and new ways of, of completing projects of their own. So on this one, they wanted to use a CO2 high temperature heat pump. So a heat pump that can get typically to 80 degrees, 80 degrees or above. Using CO2, it's one of the lowest GWP natural refrigerants. So looking at a high temperature, we're at either R290 or CO2. So we're looking at a, a UK manufacturer that we've partnered with, which is Clade. Clade have their model, which is called the Acer, which is their CO2. And this particular project had two 95 kilowatt um, air source CO2 heat pumps going into air handling units. As everybody that's worked with heat pumps and CO2, one of the biggest challenges that we overcome is CO2 requires a very large delta T, which makes it pretty challenging for space heating, works perfectly for domestic hot water. So we have to have a fully system, which is where we've come in with uh, both Cole's design team and our manufacturer's design team to maintain that we've got that large delta throughout the entire process of the operation of the system to ensure we have the largest COPs or SCLPs. 
So Clay, just a bit of a brief about Clay and why it was selected for this unit. It is um, a CO2, so a very low GWP, natural refrigerant, which is what everybody's driving to, towards, what is the best for the environment. A low D, ODP, um, the clay dacer as well is also available in a very low noise and ultra low noise, as low as 33 decibels, which makes it class leading. Again, we can get up to that high temperature. Another one of the things that's pretty unique about the clay and why it was selected for this project is it doesn't need any rear clearance, which a lot of heat pumps require, a lot of space around to pull air through it to produce its temperatures. So on this project, here's a snapshot of what was an exhibit. So the bottom right hand corner is, corner is just an aerial photo and the drawing is showing the set out of what space constraints we had to work in when siting the equipment for this project. And this is why this particular piece of equipment was selected. It is almost up against the wall at the back end of a plant deck. So we had zero clearance behind the units themselves, which is why this unit was selected, makes it very unique in that way. Um, if we are struggling for space, these units actually can be bolted back to the back, which is unique for a heat pump itself again, which then reduces the space that's required on a plant deck. With this again, with uh, Coles and ourselves and with Clade, the engineering for this, this was a new, a whole new project. We've used Clade's management system in the heat pump, which is quite unique. They have multi-point sensors within the buffer tank and on the system itself. So with this management system, it not only monitors what the system requirement is, it monitors certainly points in where the buffer tank is sat at and in what the heat pumps are producing to constantly maintain this very large delta T that's required when we're dealing with CO2, typically 50 degrees. So if we're producing 80, we need water to be coming back at 30 to make sure that we're constantly in the highest COP or SCOP we can get from these pieces of equipment. And that's what this monitoring system does. It makes sure that that water leaving is at the highest, the water returning is at the lowest as what's needed to make up the highest efficiency that we can get out of this piece of equipment. So there's just various parts of it. As, as we all know, once we start getting into commercial units, they're fairly large, fairly cumbersome, weighty, um, and space and stuff is always a premium. Second project. So this is one that we've just recently completed a hospital facility down in Geelong. Completely different heat pump, different set of parameters. So this is using the Italian Galetti R410A heat pump system. So R410A operating at a lot lower temperature than what would be from CO2 also works on a very different delta, typically five to 10 degrees, but we can't get those high temperatures. So when we're designing these type of systems, the things that it's running, so in this instance, an air handling unit, the air handling unit would be oversized and sized to suit that lower water flow temperature to get out the, the, the wattage and the kilowattage that's required to provide the project. Third one, which is Terry would see as well as we do, the biggest market and challenging market for us is the gas changeover. So these existing, especially commercial buildings where they were run off gas plant, very high delta Ts, um, also very lots uh, small constraints on space. So we've got an internal gas boiler that we're trying to replace with an air source heat pump, typically needs to be outside to get the correct airflow. Um, so these are the sorts of challenges that we find in you know, so this is one that we've just recently completed at Wesley College. Um, this one was an air handling unit for an indoor swimming pool. We're actually quite lucky on this project that the air handling unit was already sized to be at a water flow temperature of 50 degrees in, 30 degrees out. So that perfectly married to a heat pump where we can achieve the 50 degree water temperature. So on this project, this was three 60 kilowatt ambience um, with R410A run it at that 50 degree flow temperature to get our 30 degree return. Final project, although this is um, a domestic heat pump, this is an R32. So R32, again, a low GWP refrigerant heat pump. This is where we're going into commercial aspects of it's, it's a retirement villa. So this is stage one, 55 independent uh, retirement villas, all with hydronic underfloor heating. So the selection there was to use our single phase 16 kilowatt domestic heat pump just in a large volume, which makes it come under the umbrella of a commercial heat pump setup. Uh, this is in the ACT, so R32 works very good at those lower temperatures as well. As uh, said, so it's, it's in the lower GWP. 
also gives us a very high COP when we're adding that onto an underfloor heating system where we're only asking for water temperatures typically 40 to 45 degrees C. And that's it. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Nigel. Uh, uh, so, yeah, adding to it there. So extras on with supermarkets and, and aged care. So, uh, yeah, plenty of great examples there. Thank you so much, uh, Nigel. Uh, uh, moving all right along, uh, number four there, we've got uh, Julian Hudson, the CEO for Glacium Cooling. Uh, welcome, Julian. Uh, Julian, a very long history within refrigeration and uh, heat pumps. I mean, not too long. You're not that yeah, you know what I mean by that, Julian. Uh, um, so uh, looking forward to your presentation, sharing us uh, uh, all the, the many projects that uh, that Glacium has been doing in this space. Over to you, Julian. Thanks, Jared. Thanks, uh, A2OP, for allowing uh, uh, us to share some of our projects with you. Uh, looking at the previous ones, I suppose ours are a little bit more uh, industrial, a little bit larger than the ones that you've seen before. They do have one commonality, as in that they're all uh, CO2. So the first one is uh, a process heating uh, for a, a greenhouse located in just outside of Auckland in uh, New Zealand. So this site was told by their energy provider that the uh, that the gas was being turned off, so they had they had no choice but to electrify their heating. So. Requirement was uh, for one megawatt uh, heat pump to work in, junction, in conjunction with a 420,000 litre hot water stratification tank, which was a leftover from the old gas boiler uh, that was there. So this basically heats around about just over 16,000 square metres of uh, greenhouse, uh, mainly during the winter, but even runs during the summer for three or, uh, overnight for three or four hours. So Plants like to be maintained between 18 and 25 degrees C. So uh, the heat pump delivers uh, 90 degree of hot water to the loop uh, with the return around about 35. So it runs at a pretty high efficiency point, average COP of about 3.6 to 3.7. Uh, so this project's been running for about six months. So it did the winter, uh, it's done the summer, and it's about to go back into winter in Auckland. But work very well as a matter of fact we think that the uh, uh, hot water outlet temperature can be reduced to 80 degrees c and still uh, maintain the the green asset that temperature one of the things we we've, we've seen with uh, conversion of gas systems to uh, electrification or heating is that one uh, the hot water demand is usually way oversized so i think originally when we spoke to the consultants they were saying that they needed about 1.4 megawatts of uh, heating. We looked at it and said it was more like a megawatt, and a megawatt has proved uh, sufficient. So the other project uh, in New Zealand is uh, Woolworks Timaru. So Woolworks Timaru is the only, uh, Woolworks are the only wool scourers. So that's the washing of wool before it gets sent off to be processed in New Zealand. And this place here in Timaru is apparently the world's largest uh, wool scouring facility in the world. I think they wash the equivalent of 60,000 sheep a day there. So uh, phenomenal to see that amount of wool going through a process. So originally uh, the site actually had a cold fired boiler. When I first went to site, I thought I'd, uh, it was back in Victorian times to see coal being shoveled into a boiler. So as part of uh, the government, New, uh, New Zealand government uh, giddy grants uh, to try and to get industry to decarbonize, they uh, removed the, uh, the coal fired boiler and put in an electric boiler. But in order to reduce the size of the electric boiler, they looked to take the hot water out of there. So they use 90 degree water for washing the wool and steam for drying the wool. So the electric boiler just takes care of the steam side of things and the heat pump does the uh, hot water side. So this was an interesting project because we actually, uh, as a heat source rather than air, uh, we use the waste water. So it's sort of a circular system. So we take uh, mains water at 15 degrees, sometimes as low as 10, depending on the, what season it is, heat it up to 90 degrees, pumped out, pumped into a tank, and then the process uses it from the tank as and when. 
uh, that water goes through the washing process and ends up in a big pit. So we actually take that waste water, which averages between 20 and 38 degrees, and use that as the uh, heat source, the cooling sink, uh, to generate the 90 degree water. So this project's been running for uh, nearly a year. So that's the two uh, New Zealand projects. Like I say, these two projects were interesting because they were both process heating. Uh, predominantly, we tended to stay in food processing, as in making things cold or hot, uh, and to do projects that just require heating were quite interesting. So the next project was uh, one of my favourites as far as uh, engineering uh, challenges. So this was process heating and cooling for Montague uh, in Victoria. WF Montague, I think, are one of the largest uh, uh, fruit growers in Australia. So they built a complex out in Nari Warren, which I think can uh, process 350 million apples a year. So the uh, the site consists of uh, a one megawatt ammonia plant that does glycol cooling for the storage rooms. And the issue they had there was that they realised as part of the project that there was uh, there was no natural gas in Nari Warren, uh, even though it's only thirty k's from Melbourne CBD. So their one option was to use LPG, but the LPG infrastructure would have been quite uh, significant. The other uh, option that we looked at was uh, to use a heat pump. So uh, there's a 1.1 megawatt heat pump installed. Uh, the interesting thing with this project is that uh, the the cooling loads on the uh, cool rooms and storage rooms are seasonal. So high in the middle of summer, low in winter, but the hot water production is constant. So they use the same amount of hot water every day of the year. So in order to buffer out the mismatch between uh, heating and cooling, uh, here the cooling sink is the minus 4.5 glycol loop, uh, we had to uh, use two, uh, two thermal storage units, about 4.2 megawatt hours of uh, thermal storage on that project. Uh, these projects are re uh, really interesting. So these, are, these two projects, are, I, I say they're identical, but they're not really. They're both for Woolworths, one in South Australia, one in New South Wales. So this is a challenge uh, with HVAC and space heating. So uh, I think as a previous presenter uh, alluded to that uh, HVAC, yeah, uh, heat pumps in HVAC are a challenge. So we've had a look at this and said, well, the challenge is the hydronic system. So why don't you get rid of the hydronics? So these projects, we actually use uh, CO2 direct expansion coils for cooling in the air handling units. And uh, we fit D superheaters in the AHUs for heating. So these uh, heat pumps can do cooling only, heating only, but also dehumidification, which is simultaneous heating and cooling. So based on uh, uh, the results we've had back, these units run with a uh, cooling COP of about 5.2, heating COP of 6 and a combined heating and cooling COP of about 11.2. So they're actually quite phenomenal. So Wolves have been uh, happy with these and are looking to uh, do some more. So this one here is uh, the same principle. This is the one that gave us the uh, idea. This is in a cinema complex in Mount Gambia. This was a retrofit for uh, four reverse cycle R22 units and a small split. So the reverse cycle units were on the three cinemas and the foyer, the small split was in the projector room, which is always cooling, whereas the other rooms can uh, cooling or heating depending on uh, the time of year. So we actually took those units out and instead of fitting the uh, VRVs, we put the CO2 heat pump in there. Again, uh, DX cooling in the uh, air handling units direct and also D super heaters in there. We were actually able to use the same air handling unit. So we could take out one R22 heating and cooling coil and replace it with, with one CO2 DX coil and one CO2 D superheater coil. So again, significant uh, energy savings, uh, more than 45% based on the previous unit. Good one. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's it. I think I just about made your time, Jared, in the, uh, in the speed dating. That's the one. Thanks for that, Julian.
Lots of great takeaways there. For my, I, I like that 1.4 megawatts had changed to one megawatt because uh, they had oversized. That's uh, a real saving of money there. Let's move on to our- I haven't our... come across one project where uh, they've actually got the heating loads right. I've seen lots of variation there, that's for sure. Good one. Let's let's chat about that after uh, we have Peter Gibson here. Peter, you've got the slides on their way. As, as a quick introduction, Peter Gibson's working with uh, GeoClima, or looks like Heco Klima now, and uh, also similar to Julian, get a great history of industrial refrigeration or commercial refrigeration with Bitzer, and so a very long history of understanding uh, refrigeration therefore heat pump systems. So plenty of, of good knowledge here to share. Share. Uh, so Peter, over to you to kick it home for us. Uh, thank you, Jared, and good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Peter Gibson from uh, Geoclima Company. Uh, we're an Italian uh, air conditioning chiller manufacturer. Uh, Hico Klima is the uh, heat pump manufacturing company of the group. So when we see the products out there in the street, there'll be Geoclima or Hico Klima branded. So we'll go through here the uh, some of the projects we've uh, we've been working on at a local and global level. So um, one, one of the... Uh, First projects we'll talk to is Monash University, and there's quite a few different projects or chillers and heat pumps we have out there. But this particular project, uh, 1,000 tonnes or uh, we look at local terminology, 3.5 megawatts of uh, four pipe heat pump units uh, were installed in this particular stage of a project for one of the largest simultaneous heating and cooling installations around the world at that time. Uh, we're not sure if that's been superseded yet, but for... Uh, for Monash, that's a substantial uh, step that they've taken and with, with great success. Uh, so much so that we've also installed um, three three further heat pumps uh, at Monash Aquatic Centre, uh, and that's for a further total of another 1.14 megawatt of, of uh, four pipe machines out there for cons or simultaneous heating and cooling for uh, the facility and for the, the water out there in that, in that site. Uh, Got a bit of a global feel to our to our projects, and we'll, we'll expand on that here. So uh, we, we work in you know, in all sorts of places. So in process, we look at a, a pharmaceutical company in Italy. We work with uh, switching over uh, four uh, four switch over heat pumps for 470 tons or 1.65 megawatts of simultaneous heating and cooling uh, to to keep uh, pharmaceutical products in in stock at constant temperatures and balanced humidity all year round. So it's a very successful project and uh, very much a, another example of the capability of uh, geoclima uh, in these type applications, a very broad mix. Uh, we even go down the path of radio stations, so keeping people cool or and or heated, uh, but in a very custom way. So the company itself, uh, yes, we do have a, a core range of products, whether they're chillers or heat pumps, uh, but we also do have a, a great capacity and uh, want for custom projects. So what we have here in... The radio station RCL 102.5 in Italy is uh, two two very compact four pipe heat pumps with two scroll compressors in each of those, uh, with a very very compact footprint. So a very specific demand or requirement from the client, not just to to have a heat pump four pipe system in the facility, but also to cater for a, a very very tight site. So quite successful for the group. We'll talk about a, a very special application and something that we, we touch on here is the ability to do custom systems or to be very, very innovative in their designs. And in this context, uh, we're talking about a booster system which can produce up to 85 degrees of hot water. So what we're combining here is a heat pump, conventional heat pump or a four pipe heat pump, 4T, uh, with a booster system to produce, in this project here in Singapore, we produced 80 degrees of water, 85 degrees of water, sorry. Excuse me, uh, with uh, with uh, what, what looks like a very similar uh, type layout to what Julian had there with with Glacium, a, a rack system, uh, which which is quite successful in a process application, which was a microchip plant uh, to help help the production process there along. So, uh, a booster system with uh, with heat pumps, be that a heat pump or a four pipe, uh, two essentially separate chillers side by side or combined on the same rack, and uh, they they can produce some very Good, strong, stable hot water, uh, whilst also providing heating and cooling, you know, in a four pipe system. So very, very flexible and a very strong uh, value proposition for this application or this type of product. So, qu a quick look. I wanted to introduce to you that uh, in, in Australia, in particular, 
we're hearing a lot about different refrigerants and we've heard a bit about that today. Uh, R290 is a, is, a, is a refrigerant, very, very low GWP and considered a, a natural. Uh, we've, we as Geoclima, Hecoclima have extraordinary uh, success, success already. So I wanted, I wanted to highlight that even before we talk about what's possible in Australia. Uh, if we look at the, the heat pump projects, firstly, um, uh, standard, not R290, but the heat pump history through Europe, we, we, we see a, a performance range or capacity range there installed of 36 to 769 kilowatts. Uh, 45 units have been sold in and through Europe. Uh, we can also do and have done quite well and have a very strong product uh, with heat recovery uh, with a capacity range of 92 kilowatt to one megawatt installed with as many as 22 units in total sold. But on, on R290, it's, uh, although it's a fairly new refrigerant here and it comes with challenges in terms of getting machines into the country, uh, we, we, we want to show you that that is very mature in Europe and very, very strong as a value proposition here in this country as well when you get through the logistics challenges. So that the range we sold to date uh, in Europe is 16 to 670 kilowatt uh, with 173 units sold. And uh, I have it on good authority uh, after a chat with the Italian colleagues overnight that is, they've been doing this for somewhere closer to 10 years in Europe with this refrigerant. So we're seeing a lot of demand now from uh, government councils, major retailers, et cetera, uh, and consultants most days the, at the moment to talk about R290 and what's possible. Um, yes, there's a, a great history with the business, with the product, and there's, uh, there's significant plans uh, in play already to be able to do R290 machines now in Australia. So that's what we're doing exactly. We've, we, found, we found the strategy to make it work, to get the product here, and to deploy R290 heat pump machines and chillers. So that's the, that's the objective and something to think about. Uh, just a quick, quick final summary, uh, final slides, final points on heat pump projects throughout Australia. Uh, applications so far have been universities, major retailers, defence, government, aquatic centres, and funnily enough, data centres. Uh, they do like a four-pipe machine, it turns out, office cooling whilst we're, or heating and cooling whilst we're cooling a data centre. So we have our four heat pumps as a, as a standard range. We have four-pipe systems, or otherwise known as polyvalent, uh, which we, we can provide heating and, heating and cooling as well as heating for hot water. Um, some, some light reading or some links uh, to, to, to take on board and to reference for later for some uh, further information uh, on uh, multi-purpose or simultaneous machines, which are four pipes. It's important to understand the, some of the complexity of engineering or selecting these machines. Uh, just because you have a four pipe machine, it doesn't mean you, you need a four pipe machine. If it's, if, so this, this link here will bring you to a nice document to give you a bit of background on what a four pipe machine can do for you or whether you need a full pipe machine, in fact, to do the job. Maybe you just need a heat pump. Uh, and more recently and, and finally, uh, our propane, range, propane R290 heat pump range is, is substantial, and we've recently announced a capacity increase up to 900 kilowatts. Prior to that announcement, we, we were producing machines up to about 350 kilowatts in a single machine, but now we've just announced in this, in, in this link um, a, a range expansion from, from 400 to 900 kilowatt in the new pro series. So thank you very much for your time, Jared and, and everyone. And thanks for the opportunity to talk on behalf of Geoclima here today. Peter, thank you so much uh, for that uh, good uh, summary of what's happening there. And uh, I think I counted about 20 different types of applications there. A few double ups there of, of things like the arts centers and, and what have you, but about 20 different, uh, different types of sites. And, and clearly, there's each one has its own speciality. Each one needs a, a, its own customization skills. So, uh, well done to you all. Now, Brendan, any reflections there before we go to the the questions? I think um, my, my main takeaway. I think every single presenter or slide mentioned thermal storage or some sort of water storage or some sort of consideration. I think that echoes what we have been saying as well for quite a long time. That, that that's a very important factor with yep. heat pumps and for stability. Having that obviously gives you the option to use any many types of refrigerant as opposed to just being possibly just limited in that factor. So I think um, that was my key takeaway. Yeah. Otherwise, my other one was that just uh, we are ready to go. Anyone that says we don't have the technology to electrify a building is, and heating is is not right because we do. <laughs> it's all there. We've just seen it. It's been done many times over. So um, yeah, good to hear that it's actually happening. 
And I see there's a question, there's a bit of a question about, you know, this electrification and are you decarbonising and what have you when you're getting off gas? And I heard the COP mentioned of three most often and seasonal COP. Uh, maybe uh, I'm not sure who's uh, who's best, uh, anyone who want to come off uh, mute and comment on that one, uh, on, on that actually providing a, a decarbonisation. On my calculations, usually if it's above around two and a half, three, you are going to be decarbonising. Uh, may I see Julian off, off uh, mute there. Comments there on that one, Julian, to see that certainly when you're in South Australia, you know, with so much renewables, you're going to be decarbonising for sure. Uh, any thoughts or comments on that one? I, mean, I think I think the uh, the lowest COPs I've seen on uh, any of the heat pumps that we've done with, in cold environments in particular, so New Zealand's a lot colder than Adelaide, minimum COP is about 3.5. Uh, I, I haven't seen any of our heat pumps operating below that. And like like I said before, we have seen uh, heating COPs of six and uh, combined combined COPs of uh, health heating and cooling in double figures. But then it really, we I can only talk around CO2 because we only tend to do CO2 heat pumps rather than uh, using any other refrigerants. And with with CO2, the sweet spot is low in light temperatures. So the Timaru project is an ideal example where we're getting 15 degree mains water and heating hits straight up to 90 in a single pass. So that's sort of uh, very, you know, you're talking CO, heating COPs of between five and six on that application. My understanding is even if you're in Victoria, with one of the highest, uh, the, the dirtiest electricity grids we have, uh, a CRP of three is uh, you're decarbonizing. And it's only going one way. Yep. Uh, that's yep. at 0.6 uh, tonnes per megawatt hour. And next year it's at 0.5. The year after that point, it's just going to keep coming down. So, uh, And that heat pump's going to be around for the next uh, 20 years as well. Uh, Brendan, any any uh, questions or, or any further comments that one? Uh... So one of those questions you've kind of just answered, which was the integration of renewable energy sources and if we are actually decarbonising or not, we're going to a heat pump. And I think the answer is, that question yes we are but i'm sure many of the projects also had renewables uh possibly as part of the project put in maybe solar or something so if anyone has a short and brief comment on how common that was across the projects that we presented yeah look, i think from our perspective a lot of the even domestic domestic up to commercial projects they nearly all incorporate some sort of solar pv system Mm. Um, even if it's not to try and di directly drive the equipment in some way, shape or form, but it's to offset what they're spending as a fuel bill. Yeah, it's pretty common for, for us, Brandon. And uh, we've been doing this a lot with combining solar PV, solar thermal, even waste heat from processing plant and all those things. And like what we said about heat pump is important. You have to couple with the proper thermal storage as well. A, a question on that one then, and... Yeah, we see that when we look at electricity prices and uh, always uh, direct people to open NEM and say, have a look at South Australia if you want to have a look at the future of electricity markets and prices. And that's uh, negative for 19% of the hours through 2023, 19% of the hours. And it's only going to increase, so it seems. And, and But there's a, there's a peak, a six to eight, a six to eight nearly every day that price is really going up and so i ask what's what's your six to eight strategy and uh i, I might ask uh, terry on this one terry if, if you guys are doing things on on the way of controls that says right we can make sure we can ramp this down or make sure our thermal thermal storage is is at max between before 6 p.m that sort of thing uh what, what, what's your thoughts on this sort of a, a six to eight strategy and, and optimizing that yeah great question jared um it often comes up and, and the need to put some control strategy around optimising heat pump technology. Um, we do we do, do that, uh, take care of the uh, potentially the low electricity tariff and, and then run potentially the heat pumps as required. And then alongside that, optimising the temperature and the demand. So if the demand is, is limited, uh, physically the, the demand is limited, the physical um, heat pump can reduce in its output and then take care of its um, temperature as the load increases. So if the load was to increase quickly, we can um, scale up fast. So it's optimised is a, is a critical point in the whole application of um, systemization and, and, and packages. And that's something that automatic heating have been able to do many, many times. I reflect on um, some of the jobs that we've, we've seen and um, 
having testimonials back from our customers and some of the large supermarkets we speak about have um, you know installed many of the CO2 heat pumps and um, they're getting high COPs above 3.5 if it's optimised, um, getting that um, low inlet water temperature and um, selecting the, the, the uh, heat pump sizing in a way that um, you can get the right amount of inertia. And Julian, I think if I'm not mistaken, Glacium has some um, uh, software and what have you for is it either solar forecasting or integration with solar as well. Yeah, so what we 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 still haven't finished it actually. We're sort of in the in the ends of just the knowledge sharing component of a large uh, arena Australian renewable energy agency funded project that looked at what HVAC and R would look like in a renewable energy future. And what we said is there, and it it, it sort of seems obvious that. If you have renew a renewable energy source, then you need storage. Uh, that's from grid scale right down to sort of capacitors. And then uh, with the with the state of the energy market is that years ago, I think the first thermal energy storage art project I did, it was just about switching from peak to off peak. You could do it with a time clock. It was really straightforward. But the complexities in the energy market around peak demand for customers is uh, significant. So what we did in Montague was one of the projects, Pona Ricard in the Barossa and uh, the Barrier Reef Aquarium was we put CO2 heat pumps that could do heating and cooling, uh, energy storage, and developed with, along with UniSA, some uh, cloud-based software that did a three-day forecast. So it looks out uh, three days ahead. So it looks at the, the spot market price, uh, the renewable energy generation predicted, uh, the weather, uh, the site electrical loads and the site thermal loads. And it basically tells the system either to uh, charge, so store energy, discharge, use that energy, or a mode called solar follow, which is more for that peak demand, which is just to use X amount of uh, energy. So uh, yeah. the software sits on an Amazon web server and is linked to each plant. And I think we uh, the data that we had back from Pono Ricard, which was the first project, showed a 30% increase in the economics around PV based on if they'd have just had PV alone, they'd obviously save some money. But having energy storage and uh, a mechanism of controlling it uh, would be increase that by an additional 30%. And there was a significant peak demand reduction, which we couldn't show because uh, the site is 11 uh, metres and we were only looking at one metre as a trial. So but we calculated a significant uh, peak demand. I think the other thing that you'll see is uh, AI. I think the use of, uh, as AI grows, I think AI integrated into uh, control logic that's learning uh, will also significantly uh, aid that. Brilliant. Thanks, Julian. We'll get you on next week to take us through AI then. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I only know enough to be dangerous. <laughs> Maybe a little bit longer. Uh, Brendan, anything further on the questions or any any summaries from the questions there? No, so most of them were, were simple enough to answer or we answered them during the chat anyway. Um, so I think um, we're all good. Question was. Fantastic. Uh, thank you all so much. Uh, let me, we're just about on time, so let me just do a, a very quick uh, wrap up there. If you'll just bear with me, I'll bring up some uh, a bit of a summary of where we're at. Hang on, I've now lost my slides. Um, so thank you to all our speakers today. Much appreciated. Um, we uh, have a final webinar coming up uh, next week, and we've also got our site tours there. Um, Thank you all to our speakers. Uh, next week, we're uh, um, doing a site tour up in, in Brisbane. We're going to go see a heat pump there in Aquatic Centre. Going to uh, take a look at the best in the country when it comes to anaerobic digestion at Griffith University and have a look at a gasification project. Still a couple of spots available on the bus tour, so please join us. It's a hell of a networking event. It's great fun. And then next Thursday, we have a, we're going to go into geothermal energy and renewable heating. So a little bit more on ground source heat pumps. We heard a bit about four pipe, four pipe and I think we saw the poultry case was for, for a ground source. But uh, we think uh, there's it uh, needs a bit more love in that area of ground source. It's got a lot more to give and, and it's definitely going to be 
play a part of the heat pump future. So we thought we'd take a, a bit of a deep dive into some ground source one. And then coming up uh, next month, we'd, we've got our member update on the 26th of April. Uh, so that quarterly update in Melbourne and uh, looking forward to having a great networking session there. Uh, so that's that's pretty much it for us today. If you want more A2EP, of course, go see us on LinkedIn. Always lots coming out there. Brendan, thank you so much for, for helping and sharing today. Much appreciated for your help. And uh, look forward to you joining us again for the next uh, Heat Pump webinar. Uh, probably on, it'll be on next Thursday. So uh, look forward to seeing you then. Thank you and good afternoon. Start.